Paris or something. Oh, where are you guys standing? I have I have absolutely no idea, so. Uh, I've got this, so. Yeah, there's no USB port. I'll probably move around a little bit, but we'll see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, they say I can get started, so I, I will. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for showing up and still being around after lunch. I know I have a hard act to follow after that great talk upstairs, uh, but we'll do the best we can, and hopefully you won't be asleep. So, this is one of those talks that was actually probably the one I wanted to write the least. Um, we used to have someone in our marketing department who was like, yeah, Tom, it'd be really great if you did a talk on defense and depth. I'm like, but everyone does a talk on defense and depth. And... We hear about that and we have it drilled into our systems all the time. And that's like the most boring thing to talk about because everyone talks about defense and depth. And I'm like, how can I make this not suck? And really, it's like, what kind of things are cool? Well, castles are cool and you know, armed guards are cool and there's medieval warfare and knights in shining armor and all this cool stuff. And that's actually cool and cybersecurity is cool too. How about I mash the two together into this big extended analogy and then somehow throw defense and depth in there and then people will think it's cool. So my, my challenge with this talk was to come up with a way to apply something that we've heard of in a way that's more relatable to people. Because at the end of the day, information security, it's about the people that we work with, the people we work for. Uh, our users that we have, they don't necessarily need to know about the algorithm inside the compiler that makes the code go around the, you know, all the stuff. We don't care about that on the end user side. They care about making security and computers since all that systems usable. So my goal with this talk is to kind of extend that analogy and take some of the things that we work with and technologies you may or may not use and come across as a way that the, this topic is relatable, that we can convey this information to the less technical people that we work with, uh, the end users that need to be able to understand this stuff enough to be able to use it and work with it. And to do that, I'm going to use the analogy of a castle throughout the this course of this presentation uh, because castles, first thing, are really cool, and I like history, and I want to be able to try to use that in an information security way. Now, I know a lot of cybersecurity talks, you'll end up seeing people talk about castles and things like that, but this is maybe a little bit more extreme. We'll, we'll see what happens, so at least I tried. So let's start by uh, looking at the state of security right now. Who here does some form of penetration testing or red teaming? A couple of you. Uh, when was the last time that you did a pen test that you didn't get into something? Like, never? Every time that you're going to want to try to break into something, it's easy. Because think about it. I, I'm on the perspective of the blue team, the defense side. i got to look for every single thing that could possibly be wrong in every system. And all the pen testers need to do, they need to find that one crack in the castle wall and just run in. And it could be the stupidest thing that I overlooked. Uh, that would be the way that they get in. You know, one unpatched system that everyone forgot even existed on the network that was walled off, you know, in some drywall that they forgot about for 20 years that has some exploitable software vulnerability that, uh, you know, we have never seen before. They just get in there, then they get domain admin, run through my whole network, and I'm screwed, basically. That's the perspective of how we need to defend things. It's We need to look at every single layer and every single possible exploit. There's millions of them in existence. They're discovered every day. You just can't keep up with all that. So how do you come up with a way to better defend your systems so that you can deal with the fact that there's going to be vulnerabilities? You're going to deal with the fact that zero days are going to happen. There's going to be misconfigurations. How do you layer these defenses in such a way that you're at least better off? And that's the best that we can do. We can't make something absolutely secure while still making it somewhat usable. So, by layering these defenses, as we're going to talk about, we can make security a little bit better. And that's really what we should be doing as information security professionals, trying to improve the security 
of everything that we manage across the board in a better way. Also, something that I see all too often is you have existing, existing controls, but they're not, not optimized. You have your uh, cannons that uh, the rock is backwards. But there's always these push to get new technologies. They come up with the super amazing 4000 firewall series plasma edition. And this firewall is designed to rid the world of all malware and client zero day attacks in one, you know, split second detection of blah, blah, blah marketing. So that's what happens. And always these, you have a firewall in most of the time. I, I hope you do at least maybe, but you have one of these systems like a firewall. You have some kind of client protection. But it's just there. And then you have vendors who are like, hey, buy my product and everything will work great. Um, and yes, I understand I'm working at a security firm that sells some products. And that's not my goal to be up here and talk about, hey, buy this latest thing and it'll solve all your problems. I really want to look at this perspective of what can we do with what we have to better secure the systems that we're entrusted to secure. And by layering these defenses like we're going to talk about using defense in depth, that's how we accomplish that. And really, we always hear vendors say, hey, you, you buy this product, you spend gazillions of dollars on security, and you're going to be good. You don't have to worry about anything. That's, that's not true. If you spend more on security, it doesn't mean your security is going to be any better. It just means you spent more on security. So how do we take what we have? How do we use what we have in the controls, and how do we better optimize them without necessarily spending money so that you can show to your management that you were able to accomplish so much with what you have and gain the political capital you need to get the buy-in in order to, when you really need to use something or need a new tool, you have the ability to leverage that and say, yes, I can do this, and yes, this is what I need. And then your management is a lot more receptive to actually implementing what you need and helping you out. So this is where I want to introduce the concept of defense in depth. And to do this is where we're going to use this castle analogy. Now you look at your castle, they had the layers of defenses. You had the big walls, you had your armed guards, you had the moat with the alligators in it and drawbridge and all that kind of cool stuff. That's how we should consider our networks. Where we're using layers of protection in order to defend our systems. Understanding that the walls of the castle, they weren't perfect but they were a good defense against a lot of the threats that the castle faced. There were other threats that could happen. There were other risks that castles would face. But these defenses were layered in such a way to offer a much better protection from the people trying to get into the castle as opposed to the people on the outside. And one of the underlying themes of this presentation is going to be the principle of lease access where we look at only giving our users and our administrators what they need in order to accomplish their goals. So really, not just um, your user access. I know we always talk about users shouldn't be able to do stuff, and they should only be able to do what's necessary for their job. But likewise, our administrators should be in the same boat. Uh, an administrator shouldn't be able to administer systems that they're not responsible for. And they should explicitly have to have that administrative permission when they're working as an administrator, and not all the time. Because administrators browse the web too, and web exploits work against anyone who's using the web. And really, by limiting the access of anyone in your environment, you are reducing the scope of an attack. Attackers, they look for low-hanging fruit and easy attack vectors to get in. If an administrator gets compromised quickly, a lot of times that makes the person trying to get in their job a lot easier. But if the attacker has to work harder for that, in the case of a targeted attack, it's less, you know, they're going to be more dedicated to that. But if you're just trying to find the wide net of possible targets, you're going to go after something a lot easier most of the time. So let's talk a little bit about the perimeter defense that we see. And you look at the, the castle analogy, you had big walls. You had a moat, you had a drawbridge, you had alligators in the moat, just because that sounds really cool. I don't know if that's actually how it worked, because 
alligators in Europe just don't really make sense. But all of these were together to defend a single point of entry. That's very much like how a firewall should work in your environment. You think about every single drawbridge across the moat and gate as an internet connection. Now, historically, a lot of companies, you had all of your internet going out in one place. You would have point-to-point -point links everywhere. There wouldn't necessarily be breakout internet at your remote locations. That would all go out at one location. And you'd have that firewall control all the inbound access to the organization. Now, this is less and less the case anymore. You see a push to have internet connections moved closer to the end users for better performance just because the web is such a ubiquitous part of what we do anymore and users demand reliable high-speed internet access all the time uh, for business purposes or for looking at web logs at some customers I question some of the uh, business purposes that they have but that's another story uh, but all of that access that's going through this castle gate is tightly controlled uh, when was the last time anyone would see a castle that had multiple gates it didn't really happen they weren't like shopping malls they were the castle and the firewall is very analogous to the idea of having the castle drawbridge and gate and walls. And I know there's a push from a lot of people in the industry that say firewalls aren't as important as they used to be. Now, they really still are important because if everything is still allowed in and everything's allowed out, uh, it makes the attacker's job a lot easier. So really having a strong firewall policy uh, Especially right now we're talking inbound access. Who's allowed into the castle? That's really important. Likewise, though, outbound access is still very important. Uh, to take the analogy of a castle, let's just say that you had someone who got into the castle. They were allowed in. They passed the medieval TSA. They got their gold star. Everything worked out okay. They're inside the castle, and then they just decided, hey, there's some gold in this castle. How about I uh, just take it? Without any outbound filtering, are they going to be allowed to uh, go right out? You can be pretty sure back in the medieval times that didn't work out too well. There were other aspects of the castle, too, that uh, weren't just the gold. Uh, there was the fair maiden in the castle. Uh, let's just say that someone you know, showed up at the castle, and then they wanted to run off and uh, go write like the 14th century version of a Taylor Swift song. That's where you're supposed to laugh. That was a joke. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so, say they wanted to do that. They would probably be stopped by someone at the gate for that. And really, that's what we want to do on our networks as well. Where we don't necessarily want to have anything that's allowed to communicate outbound be allowed through our firewall. We need to understand the traffic that goes through our network and uh, limit that to where it's absolutely necessary. Now, there are a lot of malware that is just going to use normal web access ports, your HTTP and HTTPS. But there is a lot of legacy malware that tries to communicate out on high ports, which are non-well-known services. Uh, even like there's malware that communicates out on IRC ports. Generally, there's not really much use for having that in your corporate network. Uh, so you try to limit the scope of that to whatever's absolutely necessary. In the course of a lot of services, it's not going to be much. So any network that I try to defend or run, we try to limit that scope to as much as possible to reduce the possible amount of traffic that can leave. And really, if you inspect this traffic, you're reducing a lot of what can leave and what can come into the network. So this is the first step. By itself, it's not going to protect against everything. There's plenty of things that can get by this. But it's an important first step. But this is where our layers come into play. Then we add some sort of intrusion detection and prevention. Now the castle, it had its walls, it had, it had its moat, and all that. But there were people who were managing that and alerting for potential vulnerabilities and potential risks that were happening. So one of the things I always run into with IDS and IPS is People are like, ah, oh, I got this IPS and IDS protection. I want to know about every bad thing that could happen. But really, uh, that's not the best way because, quite frankly, not everything is a threat. Um, let's just say, going back to the castle analogy, there's a, a kid, you know, eight, uh, we're thinking 14th century. 
He walks by, picks up a stone, and throws it at the castle wall. Is that going to break the castle wall? No. That's a port scan in the 1400s. So basically, those kinds of things are not threats. They're not things that you need to have in your IDS report to deal with because you're not vulnerable to it. But let's just say all of a sudden your IDS sensor detects an incoming threat from a CVE 1426 cannon because cannons were the vulnerability that made ca uh, castles ultimately obsolete because cannons could breach castle walls. That's something that you might want to do something about. So your guards who are seeing a cannon coming towards the castle, they're like, well, we're screwed and needed to take some sort of action for that. It's basically the same thing when your IDS detection finds something that your systems are vulnerable to. That's what you need to respond to. So it's really important to alert on things that you know are issues as opposed to just everything. You only have a limited amount of time on your hands. You only have a limited number of resources. Only really focus on the things that you know are problems. And anything that you're not vulnerable to, don't worry about. Because it's just going to make you crazy. Also, network segmentation. Let's think about this from the castle perspective. You had a lot of people who lived inside of a castle. You had the king. You had the queen. You had the knights. You had the peasants who used the castle as their protection. Now, the knights, they were able to do certain things and go to certain areas of the castle. There might even be times where the, the fair maiden of the king and queen, the knights could go, you know, visit her and say something like, hello. Now, the, the peasants, on the other hand, they weren't going there because they were the peasants. Now, I don't want to think that I'm saying, like, the users are the peasants here because that's not the case. There are a lot of times the users are the knights in our organizations because that's what actually are bringing in the company's business and money and all that kind of cool stuff because we like to have jobs and eat and everything like that. But really, you want to understand what the individual's roles are and allow them to access what they need but not go where they need to or where they don't need to go on your network. The cool thing about network segmentation is it's free because all of our routers and our switches and our firewalls already support network segmentation in some way. It's really just a matter of implementing it. And yes, this can be a bit of a pain, but depending on how your network is designed and what thought was put into it, it may or may not be a huge undertaking to implement this. And it really can result in a significant increase in security. So let's look at this on a you know medieval network diagram, uh, sort of. But let's just say you have a web server that needs to talk to a database. Um, in this case, they're on separate boxes. Generally, people who want to go to web servers are going to be coming in from the internet because that's how web servers work. But also, you don't want everyone in the world to just be able to talk to your database server because that's bad. So one of the things you could do is separate these into individual DMZs where you have firewall controlled access to your web server and then you also have firewall controlled access to your database server. And you use this DMZ to say, hey, this web server can only talk to this database on this port. And let's say none of your other database systems are here on the web server. So now what you're doing is you're making your attacker's life a little bit more difficult. Now they can come in and instantly penetrate whatever web app you have because all web apps are just able to be broken in some way. Not necessarily, but you're going to a lot of times find vulnerabilities in web applications. If this server is separated off, you can't immediately just launch a scan on here and discover everything else on the corporate network. Notice there's no other things. There's just This is the only traffic that's allowed. So now, in order to get to the database, we have to hop through the DMZ and into the database. And then, assuming that this database server can only talk to what it needs to talk to, you're limiting the scope of what an attacker can do. Now, if this database had all of your credit card numbers and social security numbers in plain text, you're still pretty much screwed. But you should be using protections and 
te uh, techniques to avoid having that in plain text because that's not a good idea either. But by separating these access for things that are externally accessible and some more critical systems, you are making it more difficult for someone to just get into your network and smash and grab whatever they want. So by separating this stuff, you don't automatically have more than one compromised system once one system is compromised. And really, by making attackers work harder, you are increasing the security of your systems by increasing the layers of complexity. And like I said, this is already supported by your networking equipment that you have. So it's not like you have to buy new stuff as long as you have the switching in place to support it. You can do it. So the other thing, uh, vulnerabilities are discovered all the time. Castle walls are not unlike the streets of Cleveland. They break down and they get holes in them. Uh, the nice thing about castles, they tended to fix them. I don't know if they do the same for the roads. But these vulnerabilities, as they were discovered, they would take steps to correct them. We see the same thing happen with software all the time. Anytime there's a security patch that comes out, it means some developer screwed something up really badly, and now they need to do things to fix it. Because you just need to think of a security patch as some evidence that some horrible thing is happening in your software that can result in it completely being able to be re destroyed by some bad person. So security updates, I know we talk about that all the time, security updates for everything. It's a pain, but it's a necessary step. And not just application, or not just operating system updates like your Microsoft Patch Tuesday updates, but all of your application updates need to be considered. Plugins such as Java, Adobe, Flash, any of those sorts of things are definitely vulnerabilities that exist. And I know, hopefully in this kind of environment, I'm preaching to the choir about patching. But I can't underestimate or play down or downplay the importance of doing that. The other thing when we talk about fixing vulnerabilities is your software needs to be supported in order to do so. And there are a lot of times that you see companies that are running on unsupported software and are, are kind of stuck to that. You either have applications that were written by some guy uh, that is no longer with the company, that didn't comment any of the code, that we have no idea how it works, on a certain version of Java that we can never upgrade from. And actually, that's one of those cases where the uh, Microsoft Emmet can come into play to help protect against some of that. Uh, but even, you know, how many of you run in companies that still have some XP systems laying around? The one poor person raises his hand. The rest of you, good work. I'm sorry. <laughs> but you do have to have supported software, and it's going to be a never-ending cycle of software being updated and needing to respond to that. Also, there's the idea of a web proxy. Uh, this would be a proxy that is in line between your clients that need to connect to the internet and the actual internet. Uh, and this really can have a significant impact on the success or failure of the malware that could exist. Because really, a lot of malware is written under the assumption that it's going to have a direct internet connection. Now, a lot of the legacy malware, it's going to be like, hey, I'm just going to call out on whatever port I want, and cool. Uh, less and less common anymore, because there are companies, like we said, that are implementing outbound filtering and not allowing everything out to the Internet. But still, if the malware is under the assumption that, hey, I'm going to have direct HTTPS access to this command and control center, and then you have a proxy that you're introduced, uh, that malware is not going to work if it's not proxy aware. So by co combining outbound filtering with a web or a web proxy, you are making it more difficult for different sorts of malicious applications to function. Because attackers who are writing this software, they're not considering this sort of thing. Unfortunately, on the flip side, there's a lot of legitimate programmers who are not considering the existence of a proxy. So there are applications that are not proxy aware. If you run in an environment that has a proxy, you will be well aware of this. But those are less of the case. Most applications can handle that. You implement that. You work around the legitimate ones that need to be accommodated. You are increasing the security of your network by adding this. 
And really, it's a good step to do. On the other side, there's a concept called the application layer firewall, or a reverse proxy. And this is a, a way of adding another layer of protection in front of your web servers. So we know that web apps, they have vulnerabilities. Anyone who tries to do any sort of penetration test, they, I'm sure they love web apps because there's just ways to get in. If you're able to throw something like SQL injection or cross-site scripting against a website, introducing a web application firewall, it's not going to necessarily prevent from happening but it can detect some of that behavior and stop a lot of the obvious attempts. So if you have a web application firewall in front of your application and it sees something that clearly is SQL injection, it's going to stop here and never get to the application. So it's not a solution to say you don't have to worry about your web applications not sucking because you still totally should do that. There are ways to bypass web application firewalls. But if someone who's trying to get in is just doing their basic scans to try to say, you know, recon, where do I want to target, and gets doesn't get past this, they're going to go on to a more attractive target a lot of the time. So really, it's an additional layer of protection. If we have a vulnerable web app, it's probably something you definitely need to have in place. But even if you don't have, you know, obvious issues with your web applications, Having this layer in there can help protect against things that might not be known right now as issues in the software. And then the idea of positive access control um, and the separation of roles for users. Uh, one of the users that existed in the castle was the king. So the king, he didn't cook, he didn't defend the castle, he didn't really do too much. I don't, I don't know what the king did, but he was the king, so that was all that mattered. Um, but what he did is not necessarily have access to the rooms where they cook in the, the quarters for the nights because he didn't need to have that access. And the same should go for us when we're considering the roles of our users in our organization. Everything down from you know the people who are the top level management to the end users to even your developers. Um, Developers, they really shouldn't be the same people making firewall changes because inevitably what you're going to run into that case is, I don't know how the software works. I wrote it, but, you know, I don't know. Let's just allow everything to that pesky firewall and uh, we'll uh, deal with that. Even on a system administrative perspective, you have uh, someone who's trying to set up something in trying to get two Windows machines to talk to each other. And... It's really not their fault because no one actually knows how two Windows machines talk to each other. Even if you look at the documentation, there's like, you need more than 65,000 ports for them to connect to each other because no one knows. So there's, there's TCP ports that don't even exist that Microsoft apparently needs sometimes for these two systems to talk. But something like that, you work together with the security team and the team that requires the access in order to ensure that we allow what's needed but also work to make it secure. So all too often I see the information security team as being the team that everyone hates. Uh, you have the developers who are just trying to write code. You have the system administrators who are just trying to administer systems and set them up and all that. And then you have the security guys who are like, you can't do that. No. Don't do that. We can't have that. That's not the perspective we should have as security people. We should be the team of how can we make this work and still keep it secure. Because, quite frankly, unless you're in the position like I am at Hurricane Labs where we are a security company, security is not your business. You either make something or produce a service or provide a service. There is some other reason that your company exists, and it's not security. And we are here to fill a role to protect that organization while still allow, allowing them to function and operate. So what we really need to do is, is not make ourselves the villains in the organization, the, the no, we can't. We want to be the yes. How can we make this happen? But how can we get people to think about security from the get-go? And really, if, if anything comes out of this, try to take that perspective into mind as you're dealing with security for your organization. 
don't be the bad guy. Be the person who can help make things work better. And get people to start thinking about security from the beginning, from the beginning. So that long term, we don't have these conversations down the road after something's already implemented and needs to go live yesterday. And then they're like, what do you mean I have to have a pen test? That's not cool. You security people just make everything miserable. We don't want to do that. But that being said, we don't want to have our users be able to just do everything. Because, quite frankly, users who have unlimited access can cause unlimited harm. Same thing goes for our, as our administrators as well. I know there's a push for a lot of companies with their administrative accounts to require administrators to run as non-administrative users unless they need to do an administrative function. I would be willing to bet, and I've seen in a lot of cases where administrators are not always going to be cool with that. They're like, I'm the administrator, I can do what I want, I'll run with administrative permissions and not click on stupid links and emails. But still, administrators can get fished, they can hit a page that has an exploit on it, and then if an administrative account gets, account gets compromised, the damage is a lot more severe and immediate. So just across the board, uh, restricting user access is important. And users should only be able to do what they need to do to do, to do their job when they're doing that part of the job. And what I've seen is talking to some of our customers that have moved from a, everyone's an admin to we restrict the access and you have to open a ticket with our service desk to install software. They've seen a lot of benefits. Uh, one particular use case that I have for this is they, they went from everyone being an admin on their workstation to we're going to lock things down and users can't install software. Uh, they anticipated that there was going to be some pain and initially in the first couple weeks of rollout, yes, there was. Users had to adjust to not being able to install software. But after about the first month or so, it really died down a lot. They had a ways for you know the applications that were typically needed to be pushed out to clients uh, in a secure way. And then there were a lot of cases where a lot of their IDS alerts were just becoming informational anymore, where an exploit would be attempted against the machine, but it wasn't able to compromise the system because it didn't have the software that it needed to be successful. The system was patched. It wasn't running vulnerable Flash and Java and all those applications. It couldn't install anything. That exploit just failed. We were able to confirm that with the log data that we had from the IDS sensor in the firewall. And that really reduced the amount of time that their IT support spends dealing with compromised machines. And that's really a win for everyone when you do that. So when we're talking about restricted user access, one of the other things not to dismiss is the importance of your client protection. Uh, I know antivirus is kind of like the laughing stock of this industry sometimes, but you can't not necessarily have a client protection solution. Um, in some cases, there are options that are better than others, uh, but everything can pretty much be bypassed in some way. But having some form of a detection is better than none. Likewise, for some of your more sensitive hosts, you might want to consider a client intrusion detection prevention system where you have more active log monitoring of systems so that you can correlate logs across systems to see if something was compromised. And then using this log data across your organization, you can get a better idea of a domain account might have been added here, on this machine someone logged in here, and use those events to see what might be going on in your organization. There's other sorts of things uh, that can be used for client protection. Full disk encryption is a great one. I gave a talk last year about getting past full disk encryption, so it's definitely not perfect. But it is something that can be definitely used to better secure systems, especially those that are more likely to get stolen out of an organization. And then, of course, when we, without, no discussion of client protection is complete without uh, talking about Java sucking. And if you don't need to have Java on your systems, obviously don't put it on those. Unfortunately, you do see the systems that the entire business runs on some software that was written on an ancient version of Java, and they just won't be able to function without that. So, Likewise, there are cases where you have to live with it, unfortunately. So to wrap things up, I want to bring this all together. 
and kind of look at this from the big picture of how an attacker views a well-protected network. So let's just say I want to get into this castle and this company. I'm bad attacker, awesome pen tester guy. So immediately I look around, there's a moat. There's big walls and there's a gate. I know that I don't have the capability right now to breach these walls. I don't have a cannon with me. It's out of my budget. So I'm forced to look at the main entry point, the firewall, with a good policy. I also notice, hey, there's uh, armed guards there that are defending this castle. And they have uh, bows and arrows and other scary-looking sharp things that they might throw at me. Those are another form of defense. Let's just say I try to get past those. You know, I'm, I'm able to get through the gate, the firewall. I'm able to bypass the IDS. I'm only allowed through network segmentation to access the one web server. Now I have to look at trying to get into this web server. Let's say I'm able to, oh wait, I'm not able to get to the web server yet. There's a web application firewall. Now I need to get through this. Okay, so I bypass the web application firewall. Now I'm at the web server. So I want to get to the database. Oh wait, I don't know where the database is yet because I can't. my network scan doesn't detect anything. Okay, I've got into the config file. Now I'm into this web, this database. Well, I'm not into the database. I have to now pass the firewall again, pass intrusion detection, and get to the database server. Okay, sure, I'm able to get to that, but I'm not able to get to another system because that's DMZ'd off. Great, but I have data. I'm going to try to exfiltrate it. So I just want to FTP it out somewhere. Oh, wait. The firewall stops that from happening because hop on filtering is turned on. Okay, well, I'll just send this as an HTTP request. Oh, wait. There's a proxy in place. I don't know what this proxy is. My HTTP request is dropped. See how all these protections are building on each other you're making it significantly more difficult for someone to go and bypass all this. And if you have these things tuned to the point where you understand how your network flows, you can alert on an activity such as HTTP requests that are going out to the internet, not through your proxy. And you also might already know that an attacker is in your system based on this data. And it was a great way to try to figure out if something is happening well in advance of them actually doing any serious harm. So really, these are all just recommendations. Uh, some of you very well could be doing at least some of this, maybe even more than some of this, layering these in place. But what I really hope is that by looking at these different options, we can see, OK, we have a firewall, but we can tweak it a little bit more to make this better and better protect our systems. Well, maybe our client endpoint protection could use a little tweaking. These sorts of recommendations, by making improvements, we're doing more with what we have. We're not spending more money. We're using our, effect, our existing controls more effectively. And what I'm hoping that we can do by building these together is demonstrate to our organizations, to our executives, that we're doing what we can with what we have. Take that first step and then build on that. You're eventually not going to get to a point where you are constrained by what you have available. At that point, you do have a good case that you can use to help convince your management that you need more. And really, the smaller and the simpler measures are going to be a lot easier to implement and get approved as opposed to something drastic. So by taking a small step, uh, understanding your traffic, turning off services that aren't necessarily needed just as a first step, you can gain that traction you need to implement more widespread security controls. So with that, I'd like to wrap things up, open the floor for any questions. I would uh, definitely want to thank our designer, Ian, for the slides, because you would never want to look at any slides that I made. But thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the day. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah.
So the question was, even excluding the advent of the canon, how many castles were never breached or fell? Um, I don't know. Like, I know Constantinople was not breached for many, many, many years, and then the canon kind of showed up. Um, but it was really the formidable defense mechanism of his time. You know, the one thing that Sony and Target and all those companies didn't have? Alligators. Yeah, if you get those around your firewall, you'll work great. But yeah, like, there are always going to be ways that someone who's determined, they just need to find the weakest link. Breaking in is easy. So, really, the goal of this is to not necessarily solve all those problems because I recognize that that's impossible. It's making it more difficult so that your average attacker is going to not be as successful and have to work harder for that. Most of what I do is... Oh, so the question was along the lines of I work vendor side how much time do I work, spend working client side? In terms of working with end users, so or I'm I'm sorry I'm I, I'm I'm trying to understand what you're where you're going with this. So. <laughs> So, so what I actually work on the hurricane side is the managed services. So Yes, but there are a lot of cases where I don't have the ability to control certain things. So I might be able to operate on a customer's firewall, for example, but I don't have the ability to control how their internal network works because that's not something we're responsible for. But since that traffic crosses the firewall, everything's a firewall problem. Well, to, to the end user, that doesn't matter. It, you, there's a firewall there, it's my fault. So.